Hello and welcome to A Trip to the Movies, where each week a special guest takes us on their perfect night out at the cinema. This week we're joined by a brilliant actor, author and the purveyor of some very fine spirits. For almost the last 10 years, he starred as Jamie Fraser in the hugely successful series Outlander, of which season 7 is arriving on our screens on June the 16th. On top of that, he saved the Channel Tunnel from terrorists in SAS Red Notice, gone toe-to-toe with Vin Diesel in Bloodshot, and starred along Celine Dion in her big screen debut, Love Again, here to take us on his perfect night out at the movies. It's the supremely talented Sam Hewen. Sam, how are you? Oh, mate, that's such a lovely introduction. I wish I could burst into song here right now, just to <laughs> lean, just to, uh, to lift the moment. Oh, where, where, where in the world are you? Are you back? Are you back in the homeland? I am in Belgium right now. Um, currently in a, a, a heat wave. I'm, I feel like I'm in a, a sweat box right now. I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm sweating. Actually, <laughs> it's so it's hot, so hot, hot here. I don't know where, where, you, know where, you, are, where you are in London, right? Uh, yeah, it's boiling. I'm, I'm so pleased you say that because I'm very conscious of just how how wet this t-shirt is going to get over the course of this interview. It's uh, it's very hot here. So uh, so are you working on something exciting? What are you what are you doing out in Belgium? I am. Yeah, yeah. We're working on a new TV show called The Couple Next Door. Um, it is shooting in Belgium, Leeds, and the Netherlands. Um, and it's yeah, it's for Channel Four, and I believe it's also going to be on Stars in the US. Uh, amazing new drama, very dark, based on a Dutch novel um, and a TV show that was uh, very popular here. This is amazing. So you're in Leeds. Leeds is my hometown. You're actually going to shoot in Leeds. We actually already have. Yeah, we shot in Leeds. We shot uh, up in the Dales. Um, and do you know what? I absolutely adored it. I re- really enjoyed Leeds. We had such a good time there. Unfortunately, we were only there for a week. But uh, I, if you invite us back, mate, um, love to love to go and hang out with you. Mate, you'll have to come around for dinner at my mum's. She will love it. That <laughs> we'll we'll organise that for the future. Hey, so listen. Listen, Outlander yes. season seven, big one. It's a biggie. It's a biggie. It's it's almost too big to to get your <laughs> head around. Um, yeah, I literally was speaking to you, you know, a couple of days ago in New York, um, where we had the premiere. I think I maybe am sweating out also some of the um, the libations that we had afterwards because we really celebrated hard because you know it's been a year in the making. Um, the Droughtlander has been very long. Uh, and we're just so excited for it, obviously, to air uh, on the 16th. But also, we had such a good time at the premiere on Friday night. Are you? How are you feeling, knowing you're so close to the end? Has it kind of sunk in? Are you aware of that? Yeah, mate. Honestly, um, it, it was very tangible on set. Um, shooting the last few eps of this season, obviously, 16 episodes. It's, a, it's extended season. But we all suddenly realized, you could feel it, you know, like we're coming to the end of this journey. It's been 10 years. It's been, you know, life changing. We have a huge family here um, in the crew and the cast. We're all very close. Um, So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be quite traumatic, I think, actually, when we when we finally finish. On, on, the, on the most basic level of the concept of time, it's been such a big part of your schedule for so long. Have you thought about when it ends, how you were going to fill that brand new free time? Are you going to fill it with work? Are you going to take a long holiday? Oh, mate, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know how I'm going to respond. I mean, I think, yes, firstly, I, I want to take some time out, you know, really um, sort of, uh, I guess, reflect on what where we've got to in my career. Um, and then I'd love to work some more. Obviously, I, I, I can't not work. I'm, I'm, I, I hate sitting still. However, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's been such a huge part of my life that there'll be a very big gap to fill. So, um, damn, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm excited. It's a new chapter for sure in, in my life. I mean, so if it is a blank canvas, allow me to paint the city of Leeds on there. You've been there recently. It's wonderful. Wonderful yes. place. Maybe I'll go and hang out in Leeds a bit more. Um, I really enjoyed it there. And as I said, you know, we, we were shooting up in the Dales as well, which is cool. And yeah, the couple next door is set in in Leeds, though it's not the Leeds that you might know. Oh, oh, that's nice. <laughs> as as someone from Leeds, I'm like, oh, OK, I, that's that's interesting. Not the Leeds I know. Yeah, it's um, it's being directed by Dries Voss, who I worked with on Suspect with James Nesbitt. Um, and he's a Belgian director and it's a very stylized piece, um, all about sort of these people that live in this cul-de-sac and they're, 
they're all watching each other. They're, there's a sort of thriller uh, element to it. And maybe it's a little bit sexy as well, hopefully. <laughs> sold, 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 sold to the man in the very hot room. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so back back to back to Outlander. Um, I mean, I think you've said before it changed your life. Do you think you'd have such an affinity with Scotland were it not for that show? Uh, you, no, you're absolutely right. So, you know, I obviously proud Scotsman. I left Scotland uh, age 22. I went to London. I went to America off and on um, and then returned back, you know, 12 years later and um, was just, uh, I guess, I fell in love with it, with, with my homeland, right? You know, we were shooting all over Scotland. I was rediscovering the locations, the culture, the heritage. And I feel very, very proud, you know, very lucky to have also been introduced to parts of Scotland, I guess I never knew about. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're obviously friends with um, the author of Outlander, um, Diana Gabaldon. Um, so I'm right in thinking, you know how it ends. You know how the series ends. <laughs> there's this, this, this terrible meteor and and they all have to get in a spaceship and and destroy it before it destroys you no it's um yes curveball curveball <laughs> still a curveball but i love what she did with it no she diana has shared with me actually the a couple of weeks before we even started shooting season one the last few pages of of the book that she's still writing right now um 10 books in she's still writing uh and I, I mean, I think our show, obviously, we have one season more and we're going to have to wrap it up some way. Um, I don't know if it'll be the same ending that she has, um, but it's going to keep the fans guessing. Uh, I still don't quite know how she's going to get there. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess I also, that's partly the reason I wanted to come back and do one more season. I wanted to, you know, have, a, have a, the satisfaction of giving the fans some sort of um, satisfactory ending, yeah. So how did how did she come to tell you the ending? Did you ask, or was she like Sam? Come over here. I've got something to tell you. Only you can hear this. Honestly, she she emailed me it. She was like, "Oh, I think you should read this." And um, you know, I guess I guess I should really secure my mailbox a little bit more. By email. <laughs> but um, yeah, it has only revealed the ending to to uh, Meryl Davis, who's also uh, an exec producer on the show. And um, you know, I think. I, I think we all want to let everyone know. It's like sitting on the biggest secret, right? But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's it's going to be exciting for the fans for sure. Um, I, I I might cut the fact that she sent you an email because Outlander fans are a passionate bunch, and I wonder whether someone is already going. What his pass? What could his password be? Jamie Jamie Fraser something Outlander Outlander nineteen ninety five. <laughs> Outlander with a zero. Yes, um, <laughs> you, you might have got it there. Yeah, I, I probably should change my my uh, my password, but yeah, I. <laughs> I just, I just know the fans have been, you know, they've been reading these books since the 1990s. You know, it's um, there's this huge fan base, and we're really lucky that they transferred their love of the books across to our TV show, and and also that the TV show has now gained new fans, you know, who maybe didn't know what the books were, and and then have mm. gone to to read them as well. Mm. Um, on the subject of writing, uh, huge congratulations on your memoir Waypoint. I'm, I, I, I love the story of how this came about. Um. This 100 mile solo hike you did across Scotland. Um, uh, putting the memoir aspect to one side, like for you, like emotionally, how rewarding was that experience? How good for the soul was it? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, sort of getting out in nature, getting out into the Scottish environment really is uh, one of my passions. It's kind of the reason why I created uh, Men in Kilts as well, the uh, travel mm. show, um, to sh share my love of Scotland. And uh, our our TV show is obviously so full on. It really is, you know, uh, a, a nine till nine till nine kind of job. Um, we do work long days. So I guess, you know, any way you can find to switch off and, uh, and relax is good. And um, one of my joys is definitely, you know, going out into nature and hill walking, et cetera. <laughs> And another of your joys, I will say, is, is obviously, as I mentioned in my introduction, the purveyor of fine spirits. Um, I, obviously, Sassanac whiskey, but now the gin. I know. Shameless plug here. Look, I'm, I'm actually just drinking <laughs> straight from the bottle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I wouldn't advise. Uh, um, uh, um, yeah, but, drink, uh, drink responsibly, everyone. Uh, whatever, whatever you see Sam or I doing, do the opposite. Please do the opposite. But uh, yes, no, thank you for mentioning the day 
day before uh, the premiere or uh, outline the premiere is 15th, uh, the gin goes on sale nationwide in the US and it'll be in the UK as well um, by holiday season. But it's again, a reflection of, you know, what I love about Scotland, that all the botanicals are from my hometown in the Southwest in Galloway. Um, and I spent a really long time sort of researching botanicals, tasting, um, blending. Um, it's, it's a hard job, Alex. Someone's, oh, someone's I was going to say, oh, you, you poor thing. Work, work, work. <laughs> Oh, okay, if I must. Um, but no, it's, it's pretty fun. And we actually had the gin at our premiere party after party in New York. So we did a bunch of cocktails and it was so cool to like share it with all my castmates and for them to, to taste it as well. Are you, when, when, they're, when they're like, obviously as an actor, you, you sit in a room sometimes and you watch a, a movie or a TV show you've done with an audience and that's that's a, a nerve wracking experience, I imagine. Is it the same when people are trying your gin for the first time? Are you watching their immediate reaction as they take that first sip? 100%, 100%, yeah, because, you know, so many hours spent um, kind of crafting it and tasting and thinking, and it is essentially a representation of what you love, right? I, this is the gin that I... I think is fantastic and I would hate it if people drank it, spat it out, or like, this is disgusting. What have you done? You're trying to poison us. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it is. It's very much, I, I feel a real, I don't know, really attached to it and the whiskey. It's kind of one of my babies, I guess, as, mm. as a creator. As a creator. Um, I, I'm excited on a personal level because I recently discovered my new favourite cocktail and you'll be pleased to hear it is gin-based, a French 75. Lovely but lethal. Lovely but lethal, yes. I think you've got lemon juice, gin, some sort of sugar syrup and champagne. Am I right? Uh, I believe that is correct. In fact, uh, yes. And by by the end of a couple of those, you've forgotten what's in the glass as well. And <laughs> Yes, you know, a lovely, and there's some great gin cocktails. I mean, we're going to post a bunch of, especially over summer, because, you know, there's nothing better than a refreshing gin and tonic or a gin cocktail. So we should have one now. I will make sure you get oh. some. Promise. Promise. Oh. oh, God. Sitting in this hot room on the one of the hottest days on the year of the year in the UK, a, a, a bloody lovely gin cocktail would go down a treat right now, Sam. You're talking my language, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... Let's leave our hot rooms at least emotionally and enter another dimension, a dimension of pure cinema. We are heading to our virtual cinema. You are our guide. We are your audience. Let's go on a trip to the movies. Oh, I'm excited, Sam. I'm excited. Here we are. We're pushing open the doors into the foyer. Oh, there's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema for you, the hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, Sam. Who are you taking, living or dead, as your guest? Alex, I can see myself walking in the doors now, big, big glass doors, and you've got to push them open. And you're right, there is always that buzz, isn't that? That hum and people low murmur. I don't know, I don't know what they're talking about. But yes, look, <laughs> I, I, um, I love going to the movie theatre. Um, we talked briefly before, and... Um, uh, essentially, when I started my career as an actor, uh, I was with a bunch of Scottish actors, all from drama school in Glasgow. We all moved down kind of together to London, to the big city, you know, to, to try and break into the industry. Um, and we were very close. Close. We used to sit uh, as drama students watching movies together, TV shows. We'd sit and watch Band of Brothers. We'd sort of dissect it afterwards. We'd sometimes even recreate scenes if we'd had a few bottles of cheap white wine. Um and so, yes, when we got to London, I actually found myself living with a couple of uh, brothers, Matt and Luke Neal, very good friends of mine. Um, Luke is now, they were both actors. Luke is now a screenwriter, uh, quite prolific. I believe he's writing the new Jon Snow prequel. Um, and Matt is now works in the whiskey industry. So, uh, you know, a great, great, great companion, great friends. And they would be <laughs> my choice to take to the movie theatre. Oh, he works it. He works in the whiskey industry. Is he a competitor? He he might well be a competitor, but you know <laughs> we're all friends in that industry. It's not not as cutthroat as the uh, as the Hollywood world. But, um, <laughs> yes, no, very good friends, and we were. You know, we were we were living together for many years in London. You know, going to auditions together. Um, you know, and you'd sort of talk or discuss like what what you'd been up for, and maybe share advice and yeah we used to have big movie nights as well in london you know it was sort of sharing this apartment and um it's it's amazing the sort of journey we've all been on in our own careers and how they've branched off in other directions 
is there a, do I detect a, a slight whiff of nostalgia for that period where you are starting out? And obviously you've gone on to huge success, but that the unknown ahead of you sort of going, is it going to work out for me? Absolutely, mate. There was, you know, as a jobbing actor, I think um, starting off in the industry, you're just learning your craft and learning who the players are. And, you know, there were many times we'd find ourselves, you know, meeting up on, I don't know, the South Bank in London and you'd sort of, share a beer because you couldn't really afford one each and um and <laughs> just sort of discussing about who you've met and what you know what your dreams aspirations are um the theater scene in london is obviously really big um so we have lots of friends in that and i guess you know you're only a few steps away from you know people who are being successful rubbing shoulders with them and yeah it's there's a, there's a real buzz about it a, real, a buzz and excitement about the unknown yeah that's that must be weird when someone's success perhaps sort of like it, it erupts for them and you're sort of going, oh my God, am I being left behind? And then you're, you're waiting and then your own moment happens. It must be a really exciting but nerve-wracking and anxious time. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I used to work, uh, you know, as a cocktail bartender in, in various establishments. And I remember coming back from the US um, after, a, you know, successful but unsuccessful pilot season in the US and, you know, it was pretty penniless working in a bar again and with my friend, Matt, who was also making cocktails. And um, I got this audition for this show called Outlander and knew nothing about it. You know, he was like, I'm really excited for you, mate. I think this is it. And I was like, you know, I don't think so. It's not never going to happen. And um, yeah, he was there in that moment, you know, when when I sort of got the call to to audition. And I think it really was a life changing moment for me. So, uh, yeah, I've, well, it certainly was. And uh, and I guess I, I guess when you got the call and did the audition and then they came back to you and went, Sam, we actually want you for Jamie. Was it an immediate yes for you? Like in that moment before, without knowing what it was going to go on to be? That's a good question. I mean, I think, it, of course, it was an immediate yes. I wanted to to jump into a role and wanted to work. Um, but I had no idea about the enormity of what it could become. I thought, you know, one or two seasons max, um, really didn't understand the sort of, I guess, excitement or fervor of the fans about, you know, this character. What an iconic character he is as well. You know, he's one of those characters that I think rarely come along um, in, in your career. And so I, I guess, yeah, thank God I didn't know. I think I probably would have thought twice about it. <laughs> All right. Well, it's Matt and Luke joining you for this trip to the movies. Now there's the clock on the wall in the foyer and it's reading a specific time. What time of day have we gone to the cinema? Yeah, I thought about this a bit. Um, to be honest, mate, this whole podcast has given me so much anxiety because, <laughs> because I really had to get the answers right. And I think it's so weird, isn't it, that somehow movie, your movie choices and are, are a reflection of who you are. And um, I think it's incredible. Anyway, so, uh, yes, I've thought about this a great deal. And, you know, I enjoy a late night screener. I think there's something quite fun about going to the movies at nighttime. However, I also want to have time after the movie to sit with my mates, probably in a bar with a cocktail, and discuss the movie and talk about, you know, the, 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 the screenwriting or the acting or the direction. So, yes, I think the afternoon, late afternoon, still time to go out afterwards, have some drinks, have some dinner and discuss what we've just seen. That's great. So you enjoy you enjoy the dissection of a film like over a couple of drinks afterwards. You, you don't like to sit with it on your own. You enjoy the company of others, hearing other people's opinions. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I do love going to the cinema on my own. I really enjoy that, actually. And used to do that a lot when I was living in London. I felt, um, you know, there's something quite reflective about it. And I know not everyone likes to go to the cinema on their own, but I would suggest and, and encourage everyone to go do it. Um, it could be something quite reflective in that. But there's nothing better than be able to sit afterwards and, and you know, talk about what you've just seen. All right, then. Well, we're going in the late afternoon. Now, you have booked the tickets for our cinema trip, Sam. Where in the auditorium are we sitting? This is probably the most common answer. But look, the best seats are always going to be sort of mid, mid towards the back. Um, mm -hmm. In the front, I'm just, you just, it's just too close, isn't it? Especially the cinema screens these days. Um, yeah, and you're going to get a sore neck. Your eyes are going to sort of, go cross-eyed if you're sitting too close so in the middle um but i want a lot of room i want space maybe maybe you know we're not all sitting right next to each other we've maybe got a lot of space i'm a big guy my friends are also big guys so we need to 
We need to stretch out. And maybe it's one of those cinemas that has, you know, the recliners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which I've only tried recently, and I was actually a little bit worried about it because I was like, I'm thinking I'm going to fall asleep here because it's almost like a bed. <laughs> and you put your feet up and you're sort of you're stretched right back. Um, I actually quite like the old school cinemas. And we've got one in um, Glasgow that I go to quite regularly. And they have couches that you can you can book so you can sit with your friends on a big couch or just lie on the couch yourself like you're in your own home. <laughs> oh wow! Is that is it was it a, is it an old cinema? Is it a new cinema? Is it one that you went to as a kid? Is it like is it independent? Is it a chain? No, it's an independent. It's called the Grosvenor. It's in the west end of Glasgow. Um, I think it's been refurbed recently, but um, I. I love going there, especially as a drama student, actually. Um, it's in a really cool little lane called Ashton Lane, which, again, has some great bars and restaurants. But it, it's a sort of independent, so it will show, you know, features that are maybe less popular. Um, and again, you know, if you can get one of the couches at the back, you can take a drink in with you. Relax. Treat it like it's your own home. Just remember mm -hmm. to keep your clothes on, because that could be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait. So when you're a drama student and you're watching uh, movies and you're thinking about your own future, it, can you relax? What am I wearing? <laughs> you're about to ask me, what am I wearing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you able to relax and just enjoy the the, the movie, or is, does it feel like work? Are you going, oh my god, I, that's a brilliant thing that that person did. I can use that myself. Or oh, I see what they're doing. Is it is it like research? Yeah, I I don't know about other actors, but. I, f I find it hard to watch some movies or some TV shows. Um, I actually tend to lean in towards documentaries when I have the choice these days um, because I do find myself sometimes watching critically. Um, but again, if it's an amazing movie or a great performance, I think you do lose yourself in it and you're, you know, you're caught up in the story, you're caught up in the emotion of it and therefore um you don't see it but i have to admit yeah recently i found it harder um and i love a good documentary i just love it i think sometimes documentaries have so much more life um reflective of life or uh, pathos or, or or empathy and you're just you're just caught up by these amazing documentary makers right now there's so many good ones Mm. I, and it also counts as learning as well. You get to walk away going, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I, that was that was kind of learning. I learned. Right. I know. I know more than yeah. I did." <laughs> yes. Let me now tell you about octopuses <laughs> and how you should be the uh, yes, yes, and uh, and I've I've also climbed Everest on, from the north side. Of course, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Is, are you okay even saying the word Everest? Because I know there was that movie. And is it happening? Has it gone away? The Ewan McGregor and you going up Everest movie? What's happened? Yes, it, that wasn't a documentary. That was uh, a, an actual thing. It was, um, mm. yes, a, a great script. It's been around for a while. And, and we were, I guess, slated to, to do it, unfortunately, with, you know, various budgets, COVID and scheduling. It, it's not happened. I'm not going to say it's gone away forever. Who knows? Um, but I would have loved it. It's, a, it's a, a fascinating story. The one about George Mallory and his attempt to reach the top of Everest back in the 1920s, which I personally believe he made it. I think he made it to the top. Um, there's a lot of great evidence about it. Um, but what incredible characters going up there in, you know, mm. tweed jackets and um, taking, you know, champagne and caviar with them. And, um, <laughs> but no, they were incredible climbers as well. I think George, especially coming out of the, you know, the war and they, they sort of, affected by that but then going up and taking the biggest challenge that they could find which is to climb Everest that had never been climbed before yeah yeah well I'm you know touch wood I'm touching wood all around me I'd love to see you in that movie it sounds right up your street I think it'd be great but as 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 you know let's fingers crossed so anyway back to our virtual cinema trip so the one thing we haven't got before we leave the foyer and head towards the auditorium is our snacks Oh, smell, all those smells, Sam. The foyer is full of wonderful smells. All manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available. What are you taking in to eat? Is it full of wonderful smells? I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I look, I think everyone loves popcorn. I think it's it's synonymous with going to the cinema. And um, it, it, I, I do like, you know, a mix of sweet and salt. I would probably choose that. I'm a little disappointed when I go to America. 
I have to say I'm sorry to our friends across the Atlantic. Um, firstly, their popcorn is not sweet or salty. They have butter, but it's it's not butter. I can't believe it's I, not butter. I've... It's like some sort of oil. <laughs> I've heard about this. Yeah, a, a couple of American guests have mentioned this. It, uh, they 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 say it's they call it butter, but it's 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 something much darker, much more sentient. It's a reflection of uh, yes, the dark <laughs> side of where cinema snacks can go. Um, and also, I was a huge fan of pick and mix in the past. I tend to stay away from it now because it's just dangerous for me. Um, you know, my bank balance is reduced every time I walk past the pick and mix store. <laughs> Um, but yes, they don't even have a pick mix in the US. They have a variety of hot snacks, which I think is, sorry, but it's a little sacrilegious. It's not a restaurant. It's a cinema. Sorry, guys. Mm. Sorry. So we are immediately, we're immediately writing off hot dogs, pizza, burgers, nachos. Um, um, no. Firstly, nachos are noisy. Hot dogs and pizzas. It, it, it's it's ridiculous because also you're watching a movie and how you know I can I just can't even imagine eating a hot dog whilst watching a movie. It's just going to get everywhere. It's going to be messy. Um, save that for afterwards. Get yourself some popcorn. You can share it with your friends. You can throw it at people if you get bored. It's it's perfect. I refuse to believe that you've thrown popcorn in a cinema, Sam. You are not that guy. <laughs> Probably without meaning to. Yeah, probably without meaning to. Um, it's great. I love popcorn. It's delicious. And yeah, if you're going to put some sweet snacks in there as well, you know, I think that's controversial, isn't it? If you throw in some oh. chocolate or whatever. Okay, so, so far, you've got a mixed popcorn, no hot food. That's sacrilege. Um, are we taking a drink in with us? Yeah, I mean, shameless plug, right? But I have to take my gin in with me. I think a gin and sonic. Lovely. Um, Not shameless. Or, you know, something cold and refreshing. So I'm going to say a gin and tonic. A Sassanac gin and tonic. There you go. Um, you're set up. It's delicious. This is... I love, th I love this order. I love the simplicity, but the beauty of this order. I think the, 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 the mixed popcorn with a little bit of the, the saltiness there with that, that the tang of the citrus in the gin and tonic. Oh, yes. oh. oh I'm salivating already. <laughs> it's going to quench your thirst and then the... Salty popcorn to make you more thirsty, but um, well, we've got a whole bottle of Sasa with us. So. <laughs> It's my cinema. It is. It's your cinema. We're stocking your gin, drinking your gin and tonic with your mixed popcorn. All right, let's leave the foyer. We've got everything we need. I were pushing open the doors into the corridor down towards the auditorium. Now, the corridor is looking a bit bare at the moment. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put up posters along the wall to illustrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster depicts your fondest movie memory. Uh, this is great. Okay, um, so when I was brought up in the southwest of Scotland, there was one small movie theatre. It was a long drive away in a place called Castle Douglas, and it was literally a movie theatre. It was shaped like a theatre. They had boxes. Um, it had a big split down the screen, and um, <laughs> they, they were, during the show, well, they'd, firstly, they'd always show, like, a cartoon before the main event. Um, and then halfway through the main event... They, they would stop the reel and the purveyor would come out and he'd sell cinema snacks, ice creams, whatever they used to sell in those days. But it was this incredible old cinema. Um, and I used to go there as a kid and watch lots of Disney movies. Um, my mom took me, I remember this very specifically, she took me to go watch a, a Disney movie with a friend of mine. Um, and we came out and she was like, I've just been to see something else in the screen next door. Um, uh, and she took us in to go see that. It was a film called Turner and Hooch. And it blew my mind because until that point, all I'd ever watched were Disney movies, you know, cartoons. And then suddenly I was watching this movie about a guy and a dog. The dog was salivated everywhere. I also got to see two movies in one day, which I thought was unheard of. Um, so, yes, my first movie poster will be Turner and Hooch. Tom Hanks, what an absolute legend. Oh my God! What a movie! I remember there was that. It was the the movie. It was the it was the dog cop movie. Summer there was Canine James Belushi and that big dog, and then there was Turner and Hooch. Um, now this is going to be a spoiler, but obviously you were quite young. Hooch dies in the movie. Stop. Oh, so do you remember? So sad, so sad. But what a great relationship! And 
I mean, that is, that, I don't know how they managed to get that dog to salivate so much as well, actually, thinking about it. I mean, it was there's slow-mo shots of it shaking its head and this saliva just going <laughs> everywhere. But um, but I guess the real star, apart from the dog, who's a brilliant, was, was was Tom Hanks. And he's just incredible. And I think throughout my whole, you know, growing up, you know, watching Cast Away or, or you know, whatever you know, movie he's been in, Sleepers in Seattle more recently, you know, because I was watching a lot of Nora Ephron movies. Um, you know, I think he's just such an incredible actor and it's been so great to watch his career as he's, you know, gone from romantic comedies to comedies to, to doing more serious stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were, I imagine you were watching a lot of Nora Ephron in preparation for Love Again? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Love Again was, I guess, an homage to, to the Nora Ephron movies. There's a few uh, moments in there or... or <laughs> Key, key things that happen, for instance, even like the way that text message gets mixed up and sent to this phone, you know, there's even the, the shooting style of it as well. I know that Jim Strauss, our director, he, he was a great fan of Nora Ephron movies. So, yeah, we, we tried to capture that. Um, I wouldn't say we're as good as Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. You know, what an incredible duo. But I did watch a lot of those films just to kind of try and capture the essence of that, yeah. So Turner and Hooch is the first poster we're putting up for your fondest movie memory. Have you have, have you have you got a dog? Have you want do you want a dog? I guess you travel so much, I guess it wouldn't be fair. Mate, this might be controversial. I'm more of a cat person. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know. Um maybe it's my fascination with cat woman. I don't know. I mean Michelle Pfeiffer <laughs> was really probably my first crush, but but uh no, the cats I, I love, they're probably a lot more independent and I do travel, I do work a lot. It'd be hard for me to have a dog. I mean, I would love one, of course. I've had dogs growing up as a, as a, as a child, but um, I think I, I would love a cat. Yeah, sorry. A hundred percent with you. Uh, complete transparency, Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer, Batman Returns, my first movie crush as well. I mean, just wow. Cheers to that. Just wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, have you seen that? There's that video... I think Sarah Green, I don't know what on social media, where she doing a take and I think uses the whip and she hits like five mannequins, the heads of five mannequins in real time, just using the whip and then like styles it out and walks out cat all cat like. Um, what an incredible performance that was. Yeah, yeah. I know the bit you mean. It's where she she does the flip, like she like flips maybe five times out of the shop and then just goes. Meow, and the whole building explodes behind her, and it gives me goosebumps just talking. Yes, I think yeah. the the whip is a sort of skipping rope, actually, isn't it? Yeah, yes. so good. Yes. So good. Yeah, exactly. All right, Turner and Hooch is on the wall. Our second movie poster, as we continue down the corridor, depicts your worst movie memory. Oh, I was just thinking of another fun movie memory, but um, a worst movie memory. What's what, what's your fun movie memory? Well, I could see you were lost in thought. Then. I, I was, uh, yeah, no, I. So I just remember going with a friend of mine when I was probably about twelve years old. I'd moved to Edinburgh, you know, to a multiplex cinema. Never, you know, been to one of these magical places, mm. and we we went to see uh, this little movie called Jurassic Park, and it. <laughs> I just remember sitting. I think we were actually in the front row because we could get get any better seats. And when, you know, the raptors sort of pop out, I remember the whole row, everyone pushed, jumping back. And the first moment, you know, when they see the diplodocus walking across and I was just in awe of like, what are we seeing right now? How is this real? It looks so real. Um, to my mind, actually, some of the CGI in that is better than some of the stuff we get now. But um, it, interestingly, after the movie, I was walking home with my friend and there was a movie being shot in the streets of Edinburgh and we were asked to be extras. So I guess that could have been one of my first time on screen in this movie. And I think it was called something like The Priest, The Pirate and the something or other. I can't even remember. I just know that we got paid in pizza and I found it very boring. We <laughs> around for hours. But... Oh, wow. So your first movie credit, I'm going to obviously look it up after the show. Uh, it, it, that was out immediately after Jurassic Park paid for in pizza. Uh, have you got used to the hanging around by now or is it still the worst part of the job? It's uh, certainly um, certainly a, a requisite, prerequisite, but, uh, I, you know, it is some of, the, some of the time you do have to hang around for quite a while. But I think I was just mostly disappointed whilst being an extra that there were no dinosaurs and 
you know, raptors jumping out. Um, but yeah, that that movie obviously Jurassic Park was you know incredible, um, incredible sort of start of that world of CGI. But also, I guess yeah, then going on a film set myself was pretty cool. We are not a far apart, you and I, age-wise, and I, I completely agree. I think I walked out of that movie going, so dinosaurs apparently are real? Uh, they're on this island somewhere in the ocean, so they exist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it must be real, so they must have done it. Um, you know, the pterodactyls <laughs> and stuff. Crazy, but, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel almost guilty having to move us away from these wonderful movie memories onto your worst movie memory, but I, I need to put up a poster for your worst movie memory. Okay, so, and it, it's... It's probably so bad that I sort of blocked it out, so I can't even remember quite who's in it. It's a it's a movie called The Piano, mm -hmm. um, and I think also around that age uh, I was taken to see it. May have been a bit young for the movie. Um, there's a lot of graphic content in that uh, movie, um, quite uh, quite intimate scenes, I think, and maybe quite violent scenes. I seem to remember someone getting fingers chopped off or. Um, something like that and um am i talking about the right movie here the piano so the piano is i i get no. confused between the the piano go okay no carry on is it the piano no carry on so it, it, I, uh, f full disclosure there's the pianist and there's the piano and i have seen this is where i the i piano. full disclosure okay it is the piano okay so yes going back to it, it full disclosure that's why i've literally blocked it out it it not that it's a bad movie. I'm sure it's a great movie. I'm sure the acting was so good that I was, it was so intense. I was sitting with my mum in the movie theatre as an awkward teenager, having to watch these quite intimate scenes and horrific scenes. I remember sweating, not wanting to watch it and just wanting the whole thing to be over very, very quickly. I don't know why my mum subjected me to that, but um, I guess she thought, again, next to Turner and Hooch, it was an education. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm completely with you on that journey. And um, I, whenever a, uh, a scene, scenes of sexual nature came on the TV when I was sitting with my mum watching a, a movie, it's like you almost have this out of body experience where you, you freeze. It's like you just, I just remember freezing and just going, "This will be over soon. This will be over soon. This will be over soon." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think maybe it is something that adults do for for teenagers, just to you know, just to mess with them. Um, but, and I guess quite interestingly, I suppose, you know, my TV show and Outlander, we have a lot of intimate scenes. So maybe it's some sort of karmic return or get back at me. Um, just looking at it, it's James Campion. And it's won, it won a lot of, or it was nominated uh, and won uh, Academy Awards. So it was clearly a very mm. good movie. I should probably watch it again. I just might get PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it, it's, it, it's a very respected movie, but... Again, it is, it's all about circumstance and who you watch movies with that kind of dictates the way you think about them forever. No, I'm sorry, Jane. I'm sorry to the piano. <laughs> I'm sure it's the piano. <laughs> okay, your worst movie memory. We're putting up a poster for the piano. Okay, our third poster depicts the last performance, Sam, that brought you to tears. Oh, dear God. Well, I hadn't thought of this one. Um, the last performance that brought me to tears... Have you cried recently at anything? Have, do you cry at the cinema? Do you cry in movies? I have to admit, uh, only when I'm on an airplane, which I, I don't know if that's got something to do with the the altitude, maybe. Um, but I do tend to get really caught up in, in those kind of movies. But I, the last time I really got emotional watching something was actually a documentary um, called Phoenix. Is it Phoenix? Of, I think it's called Phoenix. It's about Paralympians um, mm -hmm. and their journey to the Paralympic Games in Brazil. Um, and I was very much caught up in that. Um, incredible stories. Each each one of these Paralympians having their own sort of journey, their own um, challenges, uh, and overcoming them. And I think I think I really did uh, did sort of get caught up in in those stories. It was very touching and actually an amazing documentary movie for people to watch if they so desire yeah i i'd say it's interesting to go back to what you were saying earlier i think once we're so used to watching drama and and relating to drama and being you know having triggered by script work and direction and the atmosphere of a dramatic film a fiction but the idea of seeing this and then going 
And this is real. This is real. This has actually happened to this person. It's, it's such a powerful, like, emotional experience. Yeah, it really grips me. I, and I, I don't know, maybe that is, again, you saying, you know, maybe I'm so aware of, you know, scripted drama that it, it, it has a barrier for me. I don't think, I mean, I still definitely can appreciate a very good performance, but, but when it's real, um, it seems to hit harder. Uh, and, and these journeys that they overcome, their, their, their physical challenges, uh, their history, their background, where they've come from as well is so touching. Uh, but to see someone achieve something great, like, you know, becoming an Olympian is just so inspiring as well. And I, I'm a huge sports enthusiast as well. So I guess uh, that's also part of play. Uh, to answer your question about the plane situation as well, why we cry on planes, I did some research on this and it's apparently because even though we're, we're humans, we still have, uh, and we're like, oh, we're on a plane, da da da. This this works. This is how it works. You can never switch off that primal fear that we all have that you were thirty thousand feet in the air in a metal tube, <laughs> yeah. and that's why we're so emotional. Yes, maybe you're like, actually, yeah, life is short, and we need to enjoy every moment. And oh my god, I'm going to die very soon when I plummet to the earth. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I used to have a, a sort of fear of flying um it would cross my mind every time you know i thought about it um and years ago now but i did a i did a docu film um all about the youngest spitfire pilot and uh a true story uh um welling and um i can't remember the name of the book now but um first light and uh, I had to, to research and learn about, you know, aeroplanes and aerodynamics. And I realized, you know, that these things, the physics of them are that they will fly, that they will actually will take off and will land and be able to glide. So I realized, actually, you know, this thing in the sky, it's meant to be just due to physics. So, so ultimately, <laughs> I guess my fear was taken away and I actually don't feel as scared these days. Do you do you so do you actually enjoy flight? I love a long haul flight. The 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 LA to the UK flight, twelve hours on a flight. I, oh, it's is it not is it not brilliant? Because you measure it in terms of meals and movies. You're like, okay, yeah. I can fit in two movies and a meal, or maybe a, a TV series <laughs> and a meal and a sleep. Um, it's wonderful. Whereas the New York flight, which I just did recently, is dare I say it, awful. It's only six hours. By the time you take off and land, you only have four hours and it's not enough time to sleep or watch a movie. You can, but then you're going to be exhausted. So um, let, I petitioned to make the New York, London, Brussels like longer. <laughs> if they could just go into <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah and they say at the dawn of a new era where we're trying to get to places quicker you're like no 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 no. 12 hours minimum <laughs> it, it is great and i love it when you can you know sit and watch a good movie and then you know oh, i'm just gonna watch one more and then you know you're still gonna get a good sleep as well it's it's uh it's great and it's actually where i catch up with a lot of movies you know i do work a lot and um find it hard to sit down and spend time watching a movie when i've been working but yeah when i'm on a plane it's you're trapped you're trapped and you just have to you know sit and enjoy it and i really do enjoy that time out because it's because it's guilt-free as well it's like this i can't be doing i can't go running i can't do any exercise can't i can't i literally guilt-free eating drinking or watching tv <laughs> yes i'm thinking the cinema now that we're going to we should just put it on a plane right and then <laughs> yeah yeah that that works so I, if you want to make it a flying cinema i love it i i will say this entire this, Go on. It's a flying cinema. Yeah, because then when you come off out of the movie theater, you're somewhere else. And, and yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's also practical. I, I, I will say that uh, this entire conversation uh, for me is uh, based on based on when someone else is paying for the flight and you get put in business. This is a, this is this is a very specific circumstance for me. Of course, yes. No, if it was coach, <laughs> I think. Uh, and and you know what? I guess this is one of the perks is when you know someone else is paying for these flights, um, and you do mm. feel rather guilty uh, at first when you first sit in that seat, and then once you press the button and it reclines, you're like, I don't feel guilty anymore. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh right then we're putting up a poster for phoenix right our final movie poster before we enter the auditorium is your unpopular movie opinion oh wow okay so i, I suppose the documentary thing is not unpopular i just i would say that i would rather 
generally I do choose a, a documentary over a scripted movie these days, but which might lead me to my unpopular movie uh, opinion, which is, and I have to be very careful here, these sort of superhero movies that have been prevalent recently, maybe one's beginning with M. I, I, I can't, and I, I'm lost, and I need help, Alex. Someone help me, someone guide <laughs> me, because I can't watch them. I, I think, I think they, they, they uh, challenge me because I, I just get lost in the story. Um, I haven't watched a lot of them recently because when I do, I'm just, I have no idea what's going on anymore. Um, so I, I would ask them to, to maybe, I don't know, not try harder because they try very hard. Uh, maybe just to cast me in one and then we can go from there. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> that is the weirdest pitch for a part I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get the job? Oh. <laughs> Your movies aren't very good. Put me in them. <laughs> we can fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try this. Um, <laughs> oh, please let me know if that works. Um, cast cast me, and things will be better for everyone. It's my career over. Any chance that I had doing one now is is completely gone. But no, I just I guess I guess they they be, they come a little bit too big, and 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 of course I love you know a popcorn movie and it's something big and bold. But but I'm just too confused by them now, and I feel like I haven't read the comics. I don't really know what's going on, and. Maybe I just need to start from the beginning and I'll, I'll be able to catch up. The new Guardians of the Galaxy I haven't seen yet and I've heard it's very good, so I, I do want to see that. And okay. Karen okay. Gillan, uh, fellow Scott, uh, we bumped into each other recently in New York. She, she lives there. Uh, and I'm very happy that things are going well for her and she's obviously in, in, in that. So um, for, for, for moral support and for, you know... Scott sticking together. I'm going to go see it. She is absolutely brilliant as Nebula. Huge fan of her in that role. Great role, isn't it? It's cool. Like, what a cool character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you raise an interesting point, though. I do think if we took all the money, these these multi, multi hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent on these superhero movies and just divvied that up into, like, $50 million chunks on original ideas for mm -hmm. the cinema we'd have so much more variety so much more just like interesting new ideas i agree and i, I think that maybe you know the, the movie industry at the moment is struggling you know especially with streaming platforms and then so therefore the movies that are making the money or drawing the audiences are these big visual you know extravaganzas and definitely there's a place for that of course but i think you know i think the movie industry needs more invested in it i mean there are great writers out there and you know uh, big shout out to the everyone that's on the writer's strike at the moment because i think you know that's what they're fighting for and what they're standing up for um but yes i think it's maybe maybe the industry does need a shake up and needs to sort of readdress this imbalance because i don't think it's sustainable I, I, I think you're right. And I, I think it might happen organically as well. Saturation, like what happened with the Westerns all those years ago. It's the most popular genre in cinema. And then it just petered out. And I'm, a, you know, talking of Westerns, um, you know, Yellowstone, of course. Um, brilliant. And I loved, you know, the, the spinoffs there. And I, God damn, I would love to play, uh, play in a Western. So hopefully they are making a comeback. I think they are. Right, very quickly then. I'm, I, I'll, I'll cut it out if you want me to. You don't even have to. You can blink, blink if I'm right. The superhero movie that begins with M, I'm going to guess, is Morbius. Good, good. Okay. Um, I, 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 remind me to tell you when we're done. Remind me to tell you when we're done. I've got a very funny story about that, but I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> oh, I want to hear. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll talk after. We'll talk after. All right. Okay. Let's push open our last set of doors and enter the auditorium. Now, there is a queue of people hoping to join you, Matt, and Luke in the auditorium. Do you want a busy auditorium or do you want it just the three? Uh, good question. Because, you know, I feel it's a little selfish to be on your own, right? With your friends. But... Um, and that's also quite nice, uh, a quiet auditorium. But actually, you know, sharing this this experience with everyone is cool. I don't want it too rowdy. You know, I want people to be respectful and enjoy it. And, and I've noticed um, audiences in America, though, are really vocal 
uh, compared to audiences in the UK. It's amazing. You know, in the UK, we're so quiet. You know, if someone's talking or, you know, watching, you know, you get shushed, you know, be quiet. But, but in America, like, they are literally in the movie. They, they, they holler, they scream, they cheer, um, they, they speak out loud. And that can almost be as entertaining as the movie at times. Mm. So we're allowing this crowd in to join you, Matt and Luke. Even the other day when we had our premiere in New York for Outlander, we had the audience there. I mean, it was, you know, it was actually really touching to hear them laugh, hear them gasp um, and cheer, you know, when Jamie and Claire maybe finally get back together. Spoiler. Um, yeah, they mm. just that shared experience is, is really important. So, yes, you're all welcome on our, our cinema plane. Okay. We the crowd are boarding the plane prior to takeoff. They go wild, but in not too rowdy a manner. And um, I will say that must be a, just a spectacular feeling to sit in a room with an audience watching a body of work that you have been part of creating. I mean, that must be unrivaled in terms of what an experience that is. It is a hundred percent the payoff. I think you know I come from a theatre background, and, and normally it's immediate. You. You get the audience reaction. You can you can hear an audience whether they're enjoying or they're listening or they're involved. And uh, but in movies and TV, you you don't get that that payoff really. And generally, you know, even when you are doing good work on set, you know, the crew are too busy working to really be like, "Hey, that was great." Yes, <laughs> you've no idea how it's going to land. And and I've been very lucky recently with Love Again as well. You know, we had our premiere. You know, uh, like four weeks ago in New York to, to sit in the auditorium with them then as well. It was so rewarding to hear people's reaction. Um, and actually, interestingly, <laughs> I say that the crew don't react in Belgium right now. We have, the, they have a very strange custom on set after every first uh, rehearsal, we then show the crew what we're about to shoot. And after the rehearsal, the crew all clap and it does feel slightly like they're taking the piss, but, um, but, it's a fun, it is a fun custom to have. So they sort of slow hand clap when we're done. <laughs> that's that's so strange. What a strange idea. Like, our obligation to clap. It's like, we we don't, we honestly, we do this because that's our custom. I think it started uh, from our director, Jesus, is, is, you know, taking the piss a little bit. And I think now it's turned into, oh, God, we started this joke and now we have to continue it. Um, they have some very strange customs. One one is a particular favorite of mine. They call uh, Schnappenklubben or uh, Clapper Schnapp, which is basically a, a schnapps every hundred slates. So whatever slate, whatever scene we're doing after a hundred slates, suddenly the camera department will bring out a, a, a schnapps for everyone and they have to do a schnapps before we then do the take. Not, you know, not that this is um, dangerous or illegal or anything. It's, it's you know, very well. Um, it, it, we're, we're very safe in everything we do, obviously. And there's hmm. no no indulgence at all. But, um, yeah, I enjoy that one. That's a what I, now you see that tradition I can get on board with. But I'm, I'm pleased you said it's safe. I'm pleased it's not like, OK, so we're doing uh, we're doing the fire stunt with the, yeah. the, the sharks <laughs> and the motorbike. Yeah. Uh, and oh, it's 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 100. Uh, we have to do it. Just snaps and now, you know, jump out of the building. Um, no, no, we we are, are very careful about when they do it. But it's it is just rather ridiculous, but a lot of fun enjoying it. All right. It sounds it sounds great. So here we are in the auditorium. We've taken our seats. Now, before we get to the movie you've picked for us tonight, there's a couple of things I want to play on the big screen. And the first is the trailer for the movie you're most looking forward to seeing in the cinema. What upcoming movie are you looking forward to seeing? Uh, I am, as you may have said, I think we're around the same age. I think I'm a lot older than you, but you know, eighties, <laughs> growing up in the eighties, um, and I love eighties movies. Uh, I, I don't believe Indiana Jones was an eighties movie, but it has that kind of feeling, that genre. I'm looking forward to the new Indiana Jones. Um, they lost their way a little bit uh, with the last one, but um, I'm excited to see the new one for sure. Indiana Jones, The Dial of Destiny. Uh, is it going to be... Are, were, you, were you a big fan of those uh, those original movies, Temple of Doom, Last Crusade, and, of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Uh, I know. I, I just... I love those movies. Um, and might be giving away a future answer. But, yeah, I, I just think they're so fun. Um, you know, as a young boy growing up watching them, you know, so full of action. They were funny. Uh, some of the best soundtracks. Um and Harrison Ford, he's just uh, what a what a legend! Like he's a real old school movie 
hero. Uh, and what an interesting journey, I think. I mean, he went from obviously you know, Star Wars, but before that, I think he was a carpenter, right? He was a carpenter on set. Kind of mm. what a cool story to go from being a carpenter to, to leading, you know, different franchises. It's going to be bittersweet, though, isn't it? Because he said, obviously, it's not only the last performance of him as Indiana Jones, the character itself, the name Indiana Jones is being retired after this movie. So we'll have other things in the Indiana Jones universe, I'm sure, yeah. because money. But this is, uh, this is the last Indiana Jones movie. I love that. I think it's great that they're saying, you know, we're done and that's it. We don't want to keep making things that are not a, as good, right? And they are so good, those, those uh, original movies. And it was Spielberg you know, really just came into his own on those. And um, I, I love them, but I'm really pleased that they also know when to stop, right? Until they make young Indiana Jones I mean, you're... You know, 24 or whatever it is. <laughs> That's that's a really good point because obviously you you know with the, the 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 upcoming Outlander prequel you're going to see a younger actor inhabiting a role that you know you brought to screen for the first time is that going to be strange seeing that? Well, that young actor's probably going to be an infant if 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 at best maybe an amoeba or you know it it, it uh, I know that the prequel show is focusing on Jamie's parents but I don't think they're that old right. so thankfully no um, no. <laughs> upstart young good looking actors going to take over my role but if they do i will be the first to be on set to uh <laughs> to sabotage their performance but no i'm really excited honestly i'm, I'm really happy that that actually outlander's got this heritage and this uh legacy i mean you know that that it's created this whole you know, another universe and spin-off show and i really wish them luck with that um i'm excited to see it actually mm. Yeah, yeah, I'd see, and it's great, and it, you know, I think it will soften the blow for the 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 fans when um, the end of season eight of the original series comes about. All right, so we're playing the trailer for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Next up, I'm going to play on the big screen the movie moment that makes you literally or figuratively pump your fist in the air. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess this is also you know like eighties movies. I think that's what you mean by that. I feel like those kind of movies, you're just like, yes. And I'm a little disappointed with one of your previous guests. Ben Barnes uh, may have ruined it for me. Uh, I, I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. I think the fans know this. I've talked about it a few times. Even when I was in New York this last time and I arrived, I was jet lagged. I went to bed early and I watched the first Back to the Future for the hundredth time. Um, so there are so many moments in that movie where you're like, yes, you know, when it hits 88 miles per hour and goes through and the soundtrack kicks in, Ben, I'll just, what are you doing, mate? Come on. That was a choice. You're dis Oh, I see. He's you, right. I get you. He's basically stolen your thunder before. Oh, but look, he's, he's obviously got good taste. So okay. I'll let him have that. But yeah, I, I would say, you know, it, it would be back to the future. Um, I just, I love the soundtrack to it. I love that, the excitement, the energy, and, and I guess, you know, another Spielberg, right? So, um, hmm, the theme here. Yes. Yeah, Spiel, Spielberg produced it, and uh, I think Robert Zemeckis directed it, but Ben specifically picked um, the moment that uh, Biff gets punched out. So you can have a different oh. moment. Do you want the moment when the DeLorean hits 88 miles per hour? Yeah, and and... The, it disappears and the fire, you know, the fire tracks are there. Um, it's just brilliant. Uh, and actually, c controversially, I, so I used to always write off uh, Back to the Future 3. I thought it was rubbish. Like, what is this? And I rewatched that recently and realized what a seminal piece of art that was, how clever it was. Um, and some of the performances by the actors, you know, they're all playing multiple roles in multiple time zones. Um, and it ties up so many of you know the stories. I just, I just think it's brilliant. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's worth revisiting. I 100% agree. Which is the best Back to the Future movie, though? If you hands down, what would you say? Look, the original is amazing. It's brilliant. Number two is really clever because obviously he's, he goes back and he sees himself doing all the stuff in the, in the the fifties uh, or sixties, whatever time period it is. But then he goes forward in the future. Great three. I didn't think was brilliant. 
um, until recently revisited it. But no, look, the original is always going to be number one. There we go. We're playing the moment the DeLorean hits 88 miles per hour. There's two moments. I'm going to pick, unless unless you disagree and you want the first time, I think the end with the clock tower and, yeah. uh, and uh, the no, whole... The first yeah. time, I think, is, well, when he goes back. Actually, the dog goes back first. It was just a sort of test. <laughs> Um, Einstein the dog and uh, and he's wearing a watch and they're like oh it's like a minute out or something so that's the first time I think with Doc until they get attacked by yeah. the terrorists yeah 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 that, uh, that that was very of the moment Libyan terrorists <laughs> yeah uh, right ah <laughs> uh, the 80s oh, so uh, next <laughs> next up we're playing the line or piece of dialogue from a movie that most affected you Sam Really enjoyed, uh, and I guess so. so the line is, I'm gonna, it, I got, I got a screenshot. You, you go for it. it. So the line is, it's so, it's not in it. It's my disclaimer here is it's not about the line, but it's it's the sort of the the story of of the movie, which it really affected me. Is it is if if they want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. And Miles Raymond says no. If anyone orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I'm not drinking any in Merlot. Now, I, I laughed at his line every time he said it. Uh, Miles played Paul, Paul Giamatti. But what I loved about this movie, Sideways, um, is on the surface, it's about two sort of middle-aged men going on this trip to, to the vineyards in, in California. And uh, I think it's a stag do. Um, and they're, it's, a, it's a total mess. But what I realized, you know, watching it was that there was this metaphor, you know, that, that both characters represent different grapes, that Miles is this red grape. He's thin skinned, he's dark, he's troubled. He, he doesn't do well in environments. He needs a certain kind of environment to to be successful, to grow, whereas the other guy is, you know, he's the white grape, he's fun, he's 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 good in every situation, but he's a bit shallow. Um, I love this sort of metaphor for different kinds of grapes, different kinds of wine varieties, and the characters representing them. But Miles even drives this, like, burgundy red, shitty Saab car. It's like the colour of, you know, uh, a sort of uh, a, a Merlot, maybe. Oh man, that's such a good call. I haven't watched that movie for ages. I love this. The, it, the I, that's a great quote. The bit, the bit that always gets me is where he drinks from the spittoon after he's being thrown out of the vineyard. <laughs> yeah, yes, he goes into deep depression and just starts <laughs> drinking everything, and then drinks from the spittoon as well. But uh, he's so good in that pause, and, and I think that was kind of also a breakout role for him. But um, it's so sort of. It, you know, it's quite a sort of easygoing, kind of slow moving, but it, you know, it gets it gets really kind of, uh, I guess he gets really dark, that character. And um, it's very funny. There's some off out moments. And I, I just love that. I'm any in Merlot. I just love that. And actually, I think it, it, it <laughs> that movie did really well for the, the wine industry in California. People started going up to Solvang. Uh, and Napa, and I, I've been there myself. It's a very strange place, but also I believe Merlot sales dropped at you know completely dropped off. Everyone was like, "I'm not drinking Merlot." <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm sensing a pitch here. The the the, the spirit industry, whiskey and gin country. If I'm, if I'm like the whiskey character, <laughs> you know, and sort of like multifaceted, smooth. Um, Butterscotch, treacly kind of character, uh, strong. Um, what does that make you, Alex? You're like a gin. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of sharp. Because uh, let's go with it. I've got a sharpness to me. French seventy five, right? You've got a French accent. Yeah. You um, yep. little, little sour. Uh, <laughs> good time. Oh, uh, God, if I if I was more confident, I'd uh, I'd just uh, I'd audition my French accent right now. But uh, we're big in France, and I don't want to offend an entire country, so <laughs> I'll I'll leave it there. Um, brilliant, I love that. I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot. What a quote. Um, lovely. Right, the final thing we're gonna do before we announce the movie you've picked for us is play through the Dolby Atmos speakers the best use of music. In a film. Oh yeah, the best music music. Well, look, I we've talked about John Williams, obviously great, um, great soundtracks. And I've I've got a challenge for you. It's something I was trying to do earlier today. Um, it, 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 if you can, and this is just time out, 
if you can hum the theme tune to Jurassic Park, you have to do it, right? And then you have to hum Superman. No, that's Indiana Jones. See, this no, is the question. Can you hum Indiana Jones, su- Superman, and, and what was the other one? Indiana Jones. Jurassic Park. Uh, Jurassic Park. It, Jurassic in a row, Park. It's so confusing. Very difficult. I challenge all your viewers, <laughs> listeners, to, to give that one a go. It's very difficult. Anyway, however, um, <laughs> where am I going with this? Oh, yes. Uh, Wait, I'm, ch- I'm literally in my head trying to do it now, and it's it's already making yeah. my brain melt. Or, melt. or Star Wars da, as well. Da, da, da. If you try and throw Star Wars, in, yeah, Star Wars is diff- it's difficult. But um, uh, I'm So you're a John Williams fan, to be fair. I am you're a, a bit of a John Williams fan, fan then. I'm, I, I'm not a John Williams fan, or I am. No, you yeah. are. Those are four. Oh, those are four John Williams scores am, you've done there. But I'm not going to go with it because Ben did. Um, okay. I'm, and I, I was, I was thinking along the lines of uh, Philip Glass. There's a movie I love called The Hours, which I was kind of obsessed with um, years ago. Brilliant soundtrack. Um, however, actually, now I might be totally wrong here. Solaris. Um. I think yeah, the, that had the an George, incredible yeah. soundtrack. And it wasn't just the soundtrack. It was more of a movie, uh, more of an audio landscape. It always had this sort of rumbling kind of soundscape that sort of kind of really felt like you were on this space station. Um, I, am I wrong? Was it Danny Boyle that directed it? That was Sunshine. Solaris is the George Clooney Sorry. one. Sunshine. Sunshine. Ah. Yes. Okay, good, because I've seen Sunshine and I love Sunshine. I've never bothered That's with Solaris. It's the one with Killing Murphy. <laughs> and yes, and, and yeah. uh, I, I, I feel like it could have been Danny Boyle if it wasn't. Oh, am I... It was. It, it and was. I know that it Danny was. Boyle yeah. it, it does use a lot of uh, DJs. He used Underworld. Uh, and of course, Underworld did some great stuff on, on train spotting. Um, and I, I would suggest, you know, if you're going to get a great soundtrack, just get like the best of Underworld. I used to have it on CD when people had CDs. I used to play it a lot because it was awesome. But yes, so Sunshine, not Solaris. Sorry, Solaris, Sunshine. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, God, what? I mean, like, once again, same age, same age. So Born Slippy, dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun, from Train Spotting. Yeah. yeah, it's hard not to to, to hear that and, and get really excited. You know, that opening sequence in Lust for Life and they're running you know, running through the streets of Edinburgh being chased and, you know, a very young Ewan McGregor. Um, incredible movie. And, you know, T2, Trainspotting 2, n- not as rewarding. No, but could could anything ever you come to that? And also, How do you follow that, the, the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, nostalgia. Powerful thing, nostalgia. Powerful thing. Hey. Sam, we've arrived. It's that moment, that moment where you announce to our excited audience in this packed auditorium, the movie out of all others you have decided to screen for us tonight. What is that film, Sam Hewitt? So much pressure. This plane might crash. People are going to be really upset. They're like, what, we came up in this airplane for nothing. But look, I, I guess it is the most nostalgic movie and I've mentioned a bit before. It's Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. It's just so good. I think everyone's going to have a good time. Um, you're going to enjoy it. There's so many great quotes in it. The characters are ridiculous. Who doesn't want to have Sean Connery, Harrison Ford, uh, all those, uh, Reese Myers, they, they're just, um, just so good. And, uh, it, it's so rewarding. It's such a great movie. I love it. And it just reminds me of, you know, being a child again. So do you remember when you first saw it? Did you see it with friends? Was it one of the, when your mum took you to? <laughs> My mum's fault again. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I think I was, I must've been a teenager. And I, I guess, you know, the great, the greatest movies are nostalgic, you know, ones that really stick with you. And um, I, I don't know why I love those movies so much. I think it's just, they're, they're fun. They're silly. There's, you know, a lot of action, the the stakes are high. Uh, and I really enjoy, you know, the sort of spiritual side of it as well. You know, like he, he has to overcome these three challenges, but it's also a father-son story, you know, and at the beginning of that movie, you've got a young River Phoenix, right? 
um, and the sort of origins of how Indiana got his, you know, scar, or got his hat. Um, and then, you know, who doesn't like, you know, bad guys that are Nazis because they're just kind of comedy. So it's um, it's a great movie. Oh, it is. Those three tests as a kid, it's just like, I guess it's because it's a bit like a video game. You just like, uh, you know, that first one, a penitent man. A penitent man, a penitent man, a penitent man bows before God yeah. <laughs> and then played. And, you know, Sean, his dad has been uh, shot and he's dying and he needs to get there. And one of my greatest passions in life, uh, things I guess I grew up, why I became an actor is because the Arthurian legends, um, the Crusaders, the Knights Templar, and there is this knight who may, may not have been there forever, for hundreds of years, and he finds the Holy Grail, and it's just like, oh, my God, how did you weave in all of these stories? And yet it's so good. It works so well. Um, the comedy, too. I mean, the supporting cast. Um, is it Elliot Denham? Uh, the, you know, the sort of bumbling professor who can't even find his way out of his own museum. It's just it's so good. So good. Yeah, 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 and you're right. The the comic we called the dog Indiana is just like yeah. oh, yeah, I love it when he you know goes to rescue his dad and gets hit over the head by this vase, and then he's I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and he's it's okay, Dad, I'm okay. He's no, no, it's just it's a fake. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that that night at the end. I mean, what, what I always use that line: if ever someone buys the wrong drink at a bar, I always go, "He chose poor." <laughs> Brilliant. And then the effects, you know, the effects of like the, you know, the 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 German guy who like drinks the, from the wrong glass and suddenly shrivels up into a skeleton and ages. You know, it's it's incredible effects. And you know, there's there's tanks, there's horses chasing tanks, there's you know, Spitfire play or planes being knocked down by birds in the sky. It's just, there's so much going on. You know, jousting, jousting on with a yeah. motorbike and sidecar. Um, whoever came up with these ideas, I don't know. And then, of course, a great soundtrack. Mm. Um, so I think everyone on our plane is going to have a good time. They're all going to be drinking the gin. So if they're not, they'll probably be, you know, inebriated by the end. And, um, and then when we when we land, we're in, the, in a new location. So yeah, what's well, not to like? I, I I love it. I, I, whether you could tell or not, you are uh, you are speaking to a partisan audience in me because Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is by far the best Indiana Jones yeah, movie. Yeah, hundred um, percent. There there are so many iconic moments, and uh, I'm glad. You know, I was worried about this whole interview, uh, Alex, because I think you know what your choices do reflect <laughs> who you are, and I realised all I've talked about is Indiana Jones, uh, Back to the Future, kind of eighties nostalgia movies couple of Jurassic Park, John Williams. It's it's a little bit sad that mm. I'm still a child at heart. I think, if I may be so bold, the movies that affect us most are when we're, our minds are young and we just absorb these things. And, you know, you know, you don't have the cynicism of an adult where you're sort of like, ah, oh, I've seen better than this. Yeah, they do stick with you, don't they? And as you say, it's also the, the moments of the people you go with or what's happening in your life at that time is why they resonate more. And, you know, the early movies were informative for me and um, and the people I'm going with, you know, in my, the movie theater of my mind, you know, my good friends, they 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 feel very close to me and I've been integral in my career. So I guess, yeah, it feels good to share with them. Well, Sam, that's it. The curtains have closed. The guests are milling out, smiling, chatting and thanking you for taking them on an incredible night out of the movies. But before you go, it's time for this week's mystery question as we ask, what's in the box? Hey, what's so, in the box, Alex? Right, so here's okay. Here's your mystery question this week, Sam Hewing. You've explored many genres from romance to action to fantasy to comic book to comedy. What genre would you like to explore next on screen? If the perfect script arrived tomorrow, what genre would it be in? Well, I mentioned western, but I uh, which I would love to explore. But sci-fi, I'm a huge, huge sci-fi fan. Um, Alien, Aliens were some of my favorite movies. Uh, Starship Troopers, um, Ex Machina, you, you know, like anything. And I guess right now in the world, you know, AI is a really um, interesting subject. You know, we're talking about Terminator. Look, there was recently the Americans testing a drone and how it came back and apparently in a simulator attacked 
its makers attacked the, the, the American military because it knew that they would be its enemy someday. It's scary. I'm kind of into it. It's sci-fi because it's a reflection about where we may be in the future. Um, so I'd love to do some sci-fi for sure. It sounds like, I mean, um, Ex Machina aside, it sounds like Aliens, Starship Troopers, you're talking about some big action sci-fi, strapping on a huge assault rifle and fighting off an alien horde. Yeah, fighting off, you know, bad aliens and, and blowing them up and those goo guns <laughs> getting everywhere. But also, I mean, Alien itself, you know, I think, you know, the people, the human beings are actually the alien, the, the, the thing we have to be most fearful of. Um, you know, they, they're probably worse than the actual alien itself, especially the, the big corporation, right? Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I would love to explore them. I, I just think sci-fi is really, it can be kind of unsettling, quite dark, um, but also you know, fascinating. I mean, you called AI interesting. Have you, have you actually, have you had a go on chat GPT yourself? Like these, these AI sites, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. Yeah. What do I, you do? I think, um, I'm slightly skeptical about it, whether it is actually, you know, it's just regurgitating everything that's already out there and rearranging stuff, of course, but you can't help start thinking, what if, what if, what if it, it becomes sentient? Um, what have we done? What have we created? It isn't it crazy that, you know, this is the stories that we've been t telling in the past in, in other sci-fi and it's actually coming true. You know, I think I, I that's what I love about sci-fi. It's like, even if we imagine it, it actually kind of does come true at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Robocop. God, Robocop. They're, they're talking about movies that screwed us up as kids. The guy coming out of that toxic waste in Robocop with the skin yeah. hanging off. One of the worst memories I have. Yeah. And and also just, you know, I want to see this new documentary about Arnold. I know is, is, is fascinating. He's a great character. And what an amazing career he's had in, in, in the movies as well. So, um, yes. We've, we've, we've talked about age a few times. There's a brilliant line in the Arnold documentary where he goes, I look in the mirror now and I just think, fuck. <laughs> I love him. I mean, you know, his movies are questionable at best sometimes, but like Total Recall, just <laughs> incredible. Um, but oh. it actually through COVID, I think he, I don't know about you, but he got me through COVID a little bit. You know, watching his, his daily updates with Whiskey and Lulu, his... Um, his pony and his what is it it's a pony and a a, a mule i think a miniature, miniature donkey, or donkey something like that and i think it's got a new addition to the family yeah. there's something else now but but i just i love him i think uh, you know, he's a character out of a movie isn't he in real life he is. He is. Hey, Sam, I'm, I'm sorry to see you leave, but your taxi has arrived to ferry you back to reality. But before you go, let's recap your perfect night out at the movies. You are going with Matt and Luke in the late afternoon. You are sitting in the middle towards the back. You are having a mixed popcorn, none of that American butter, and a lovely Sassanac gin and tonic. Mmm, taste that citrus. We are putting up a poster for your fondest movie memory, which was Turner and Hooch. Your worst movie memory depicts the piano, not because it's a bad film, because you watched it with your mum and it is not a good mother and son movie to watch. The third poster we're putting up is the last performance that brought you to tears. We're putting up a poster for the documentary Phoenix and our final poster depicts your unpopular movie opinion, which is that superhero movies are not good until they cast yes. you in them. <laughs> Oh, we're playing the trailer in the auditorium for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. We are then playing that DeLorean hitting 88 miles per hour for the moment that makes you pump your fist in the air. The line of dialogue from a movie that most affected you is from Sideways. I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot. The best use of music in a movie comes from Danny Boyle's Sunshine. And finally, we are going to play Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Sounds wow. Thank you. It actually sounds like a really spectacular time. Um, I, I'm down with it. I was worried about it. I was worried that people would judge me, that everyone on this this plane would 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 be upset and look for the emergency exit. But no, I think they're going to have a great time, and I'm really happy. Thank you. I've had a good time too. Oh, wonderful. Well, we've all landed safely. Like I said, your taxi's there to ferry you back to reality. Sam Hewen, thank you, and good luck. No.